A Land Remembered Chapter 7 A sharp February wind stung his face as Tobias stood beneath the bare hickory tree, watching the squirrel come closer. The leaves were gone now, as were the patches of wild poke, and only the palmetto and the cabbage palm looked the same as it did in summer. The squirrel flicked its tail nervously, then it came further down the limb. When the whip cracked, it knocked the small animal senseless. As soon as it hit the ground, Tobias grabbed it and broke its neck. Then he put it in the hunting sack with the others. Zek had also become expert with the whip and had killed several rabbits with it. It was the only thing keeping meat on the table. Tobias folded the whip and started back along the path to the clearing. His feet made crunching sounds as he walked over thick beds of brown leaves. He thought that tomorrow he would go down to the creek bottom and gather cattail roots, which Emma would roast and then pound into flour. When he reached the garden, he paused for a moment and looked at the bare ground. He said to himself, Next spring I'll make the fence stronger and add a few rails. There's bound to be a way to keep the critters out. When he came around the side of the barn, he noticed the horse immediately. No rider was in sight, and he thought that perhaps Adler had returned for him. Hey, he had really been expecting it, but hoped it would not happen. Then a man in a uniform came from the kitchen, followed by Emma and Zek. The uniform was Confederate gray. The soldier was the same age as Tobias, and he too wore a black beard. Tobias approached the house with dread, remembering what Adler told him to say if an army recruiter came. He said, Howdy. Then he threw the sack of squirrels onto the stoop floor. The soldier returned the greeting, and then he said, I'm Captain Graham. We need your help. I can't go in the army, Tobias said quickly. I'm a drover. Who do you work for? Adler. Henry Adler. We run from the Alachua Savannah over to the St. Mary's. I'm just home between drives. I'm not here to recruit you in the army, so it don't matter if you're a drover or not. If you don't want me to soldier, what is it you want me to do? Tobias asked, puzzled. Cut logs for fortifications. The Federals have sent 35 troop ships out of Hilton Head. They'll land at the mouth of the St. John's, then they'll try to cut the Saint state in two and stop the supply lines. If they do that, there won't be no more cows heading north for you to drive, and there won't be nothing more for our men to eat. We've got to stop them or it'll all be all over. We've got 2,000 troops ready now and 3,000 more on the way. We're making our stand at... A lusty, a few miles east of Lake City, and we're in bad need of log cutters. And what if I don't want to go? Tobias asked. Mister, there's a war on, if you don't know it. This whole state is under martial law. If you refuse, I got the right to shoot you right here on the spot, and I will, too. So you ain't got no choice. And I'm not gonna stand here and argue. Them federal troops could have already landed by now. You ready to go? You done said I got no choice. Do I need to take along my shotgun? And I ain't got a horse. You don't need to take nothing but yourself. If it gets down to where you have to shoot, we'll give you a gun. And I've got log wagons just up north of here. You can ride from there. Tobias turned to Emma. Maybe I'll be back real soon. A battle sure couldn't take as much time as a cattle drive. Then he said to Zek, You clean them squirrels there for your mama. And take the whip and kill something every day for the two of you to eat. Uh, these rabbits on that patch of winter are where I take Tuck and Buck every morning, Papa. I'll kill one every time I go there. Tobias embraced Emma briefly. Then once again he followed a mounted rider across the clearing and into the woods. Tobias passed down the line and was handed a tin cup of thin beef stew and a piece of black bread. Then he sat on a log and started eating. A man beside him said, a soldier told me that them federal troops hit his raid Baldwin and Gainesville and took everything they could get their hands on. Cows, horses, mules, corn, whatever. They're even ta ta taking every inward they can find, and they're on their way here right now. It could happen tomorrow. I wish it would, would and be done with, Tobias responded. Chewing the tough bread. I've been here over two weeks, and I'm ready to go back home and see my to and see to my wife and boy. I know what you mean. I don't want to ever cut down another tree. We must have chopped two thousand logs by now. I guess, and maybe more. They ought to have built a barricade from here to Tallahassee. If we're done with it, I wish they'd let us go. The logging the logging camp was three miles south of the battle site in a thick forest of hickory, pine, and oak. Logs were carried from here to the fortifications on huge oxen-drawn wagons. Tobias finished the stew and said, Did the soldier you talked to say how many troops the Federals have? Maybe five and a half thousand. It's about even, then. 
I guess the Rebs has a good chance to win. But I wish they'd get on with it. I need to get back to the scrub. It was just past noon the next day where, when the men finished loading a wagon and started north across an area of open meadow. Tobias stopped the oxen and said, Look yonder, over to the west. What the hell are them soldiers doing? A line of horses were pulling cannons at a fast trot and were followed by cavalry and foot, foot soldiers. Don't know. But it looks like every man at the fortifications is hightailing it down here. Maybe they decided to shuck out and not fight. Don't seem likely, Tobias said. Then he looked to the east and exclaimed, Yonder, over yonder, there's the reason. Three long columns of federal troops were marching toward them, and the columns were flanked on both sides by cavalry. Tobias then said, Good God Almighty, they're going to have the battle down here, not up there, where they build all them barricades. And we're going to be caught right in the middle of it. I guess they couldn't direct the federals where to fight, the man next to Tobias said. But I tell you one thing for sure, we better be to hell and gone from here when they start firing them cannons, cannons at each other. The woods, Tobias said urgently. Run back to the woods, it's our only chance. One of the men cut the oxen loose from the wagon and they all ran back toward the line of trees. They were halfway there when Confederate cannons belched fire and smoke. This was returned instantly from the east. Shells dropped and exploded fifty yards north of the fleeing men. When Tobias reached the woods, he ran right over a stump and fell hard to the ground. Then he crawled into a clump of bushes and watched as the tempo of cannon fire increased. The cannons continued to thunder for more than an hour before men and both armies rushed forward toward each other. At one point, the advancing soldiers overran each other and formed one big mass of slashing swords and firing guns. It was impossible to tell one army from the other except for the color of uniforms. As he watched the battle intensify, Tobias wondered what would have happened if they were all dressed in overalls as he was. The plane was now engulfed with a low-hanging cloud of smoke, making it difficult to see what was happening. Once a troop of Confederate cavalry rushed through the woods and jumped their horses right over the brush where Tobias was hiding, he was not sure if they saw him or not, or of what they would do if they did. He knew there was no way for them to know that their own log cutters were hiding in these woods. The battle raged back and forth for four hours, and then the Federal troops turned and re retreated rapidly back to the east. Confederates swooped after them, rushing over a plain now littered with bodies, lifeless men in bl both blue and gray. Tobias did not come out of the woods even after the battle had passed. He spent the night beneath the brush, and at first dawn he walked to the edge of the woods and looked out, seeing that the dead had not yet been removed. Then a troop of soldiers came from the north, picking up bodies and putting them into wagons. When one wagon came close, Tobias ran to it and said, Is it all done now? I'm one of the log cutters, and if it's over, I need to go home. We whooped the hell out in them, one soldier said. Them feds is back in Jacksonville by now, but it was a bloody one for both sides. We gotta get these men up before the buzzards come after them. I guess it's done then, Tobias said. This battle is done, but it ain't over by a long shot, the soldier said. There's more feds where them to come from, and we'll see them again. But I don't think nobody could give a damn less what you do now, fella. Tobias turned and went back into the woods. He could see no sign of any of the other loggers, so he headed south alone. He had walked just over a mile when he cut around a cane break and found the horse. It was tied to a bush, and the rider was lying on the ground, wearing a blood-soaked blue uniform. He was a boy of no more than eighteen. Lead, lead balls had caught him in the neck and lead balls had caught him in the neck and chest, and Tobias wondered how he could have ridden this far from the battle before falling. Tobias removed a pistol and scabbard from the skull soldier's side, and then he unfastened the ammunition belt and put it in one saddlebag. There was also a rifle strapped to the saddle. He said, I might as well take all this, fellow, but I want you to understand. I ain't stealing from the dead. It ain't no use to you anymore, and it'll be a godsend for me out in the scrub. I won't bury you, because they'll find you sooner or later and send you back home, and I know you'd rather be with your folks than here in these woods. He then searched the other saddlebag and found a knife and several tins of beef. He opened one can and ate ravenously, washing it down with water from the soldier's canteen. Then he mounted the horse and rode south. When Tobias rode into the clearing, he could not believe what he was seeing. Then the realization of it caused his hands to tremble. The house was no longer there, nor the barn, nor the smokehouse. Where they once stood, there were now piles of ashes. Only the woodshed remained. He moved the horse forward slowly, dreading what he might find in the ashes. Then he heard a movement behind the shed. 
Slowly and cautiously, Emma emerged from a bush, and then Zack peeked from behind the shed. Tobias! Emma shouted, rushing to him. We didn't know it was you. We only heard a horse coming. We thought one of them had come back. Tobias jumped from the horse. What has happened here, Emma? What is all this? They came a week ago. Fifteen of them. When they left the next morning, they set fire to all but the shed. Zack said excitedly, They killed Tuck, Papa! They cooked him and ate him right here in the yard! And they took a buck with them when they left! Damn federal bastards! Tobias exploded angrily. They weren't Federals, Emma said quickly. They were Confederate deserters, Tobias. Some of them still had on pieces of their uniforms. They must have known about the battle and all the men being gone up there, because they weren't in no hurry at all. Our own people did this to us? Tobias questioned, finding it hard to believe. Rebs? Yes, Tobias. They were the meanest looking men I've ever seen. Did they do harm to you? Tobias then asked. They did us no harm, but I begged them not to burn the house, and they did it anyway. Damn them! They didn't have to do this. They could have just took what they wanted and left. Did you save anything? Not much, Emma replied. They left soon as they set the fires, and me and Zek ran in and got what we could. But the house went up too fast. We got an axe, a saw, the frying pan, and a few blankets, but we didn't get any clothes. It just went up too fast. They took the shotgun, Papa, Zek said, but I still got the whip. Where'd you get the horse? Off a dead soldier, a federal. Tobias walked over and looked at the scorched ground where the house had been. He kicked the ashes and said, Ain't no man ever gonna do this to me again. Not ever. I'll kill the first one who tries. And I'll kill a thousand more if I have to. So help me God, I will. We could live in the shed while you build another house. Emma said, frightened by the bitterness in his voice. It's better than what we had when we first came here. No, we'll go south. This time we'll go to a place where nobody can find us till the war is over. That's what I should have done in the first place. They didn't burn the wagon, Papa, Zek said. It's behind the shed. I don't know if this cavalry horse can pull it or not, Tobias said. Yeah, he's trained to run, not pull, but we'll try. There's tin beef and a hard tack in the saddlebag. Soon as we eat a bite, we'll leave. This time we'll go to a place where they can't find us, just like the Indians done. At first, Tobias headed directly south, leaving, leading the horse and wagon through thick woods, sometimes having to backtrack when he came to swampy bottoms and then follow higher ridges of dry ground. On the second day, he came into the lower scrub, an area he had never been before explored. He, the here there were rolling sand hills, thickly covered with titi, runty, Scrub oak and impenetrable clumps of Spanish bayonet. The dead trunks of pines pointed upward f forlornly, some peppered with woodpecker holes, the limbless trees giving evidence of some great fire that had once rushed over the land, destroying all in its path. Every small oak had bear marks on its trunk, deep slashes made by claws and buzzards circled overhead constantly. Occasionally, Tobias came too close to the bayonet plants and jumped back in pain as they cut into his flesh. Emma felt held the reins as Tobias took the axe and tried to cut a path for them to pass. Even in the cold, he was sweating and damp. Splotches covered his overalls. Again and again, the wagon wheel sank down into the sand and stuck, and when this happened, they all pushed as the horse strained and neighed loudly, bucking and straining again, trying vainly to move the wagon forward. It ain't no use, Tobias finally said, putting the axe back into the wagon. This is the most hellish place I've ever seen. There ain't no way we can get through it with the wagon. We'll have to turn and go back, and then take the trail down to the St. John's and follow the river south. There ought to be open land along the river. Tobias unhitched the panting horse and tied it to a bush. Then the three of them pulled the wagon from the sand and turned it.